This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. In this hobby, you always need to figure out ways to connect all computers and consoles to display devices. Let's learn how to make those cables and what could go wrong in the process. By far, the best way to make cables to connect retro computers to modern devices is to buy cables pre-made. <laughs> no, seriously, listen me out before you turn this off. I started out making my own video cables, but it's a time-consuming, annoying, and slightly error-prone process. Eventually, I realized that it wasn't the best use of my time, and I ended up buying them online. There are people who specialize in making those cables for you. They have the method completely down, they have all the components in hand, and they can probably make them very, very quickly. You can probably expect to pay around $10, $15 for a video cable, probably including shipping, which is not that bad if you think about the time that is going to get into it. Okay, okay, so why am I making this video? Sometimes there are good reasons to make your own cables. Sometimes you just can't buy the cable you want. Maybe the cables you need are available, but you just don't want to wait for a week for them to arrive. Or maybe you just enjoy making them yourself. Or maybe you want to make a slightly customized cable, for example, with like an audio input. Or maybe the cable you'll make is a higher quality than the one you'll be able to buy. And that's an important point. A lot of the cables you'll be able to buy are fine, adequate, they'll work correctly. But if you really want to, you can probably make a higher quality one. That happened to me with a cable that I made for the Amstrad CPC, which unfortunately I don't have here to show you, but I chose a really nice hefty SCART cable to start with, whereas the ones you'll buy use really the cheapest SCART cable available. They'll work the same, but the other one is just nicer to handle. So yes, sometimes you just want to make your own cables. The reason I'm making this video right now is that I want to be able to connect a lot of the computers that output RGB, like the Amstrad CPC, the Sinclair QL, the Enterprise, to this Commodore 1084S monitor. All the RGB computers that I have have cables with a SCART connector, but this particular monitor has an RGB input with a DB9 connector. So I need to make a cable that lets me connect the SCART cable to the monitor itself. So let's use this as an excuse to learn how to make video cables for retro computers, and then you can decide if that's something that you want to do. It sounds obvious, but before you can make a cable to connect to an old device, to some kind of display, you need to check that the signal is compatible. If it's not, then you'll need an actual converter device, and I'm not going to get into it. Just go look into things like the OSSC, RetroTINK, and other similar video converters. However, if the signal is compatible, then you'll likely just need to get the right physical shape for the connectors to get it to work. Of course, you may be lucky and maybe your computer uses a standard cable connector, in which case you're all set. But unfortunately, most of them use some kind of non-standard connector for some reason. In general, 80s computers and consoles will output video in a few analog formats, and some of them will even output in multiple formats at once, so you can pick the most convenient one. Here's a very quick review of those formats. The first signal type is RF because it was radio frequency encoded, and it's the kind of video signal that the Atari 2600 or even the ZX Spectrum used. It uses this kind of coaxial cable, and it's really the oldest and the worst image quality type of all the video signals. In order to display it, you're going to need an RF decoder, which is what initially real TVs, they only had that as a form of input. That's why they came up with this kind of input. Today, it's rather difficult to find display devices that have RF decoders. You can have a standalone RF decoder like this one over here, but that's also not very common. Fortunately, what happens is a lot of these machines generated a composite video signal first, and then they encoded it in RF. So oftentimes we can mod them to output that composite video out, which is a lot easier to deal with in modern display devices. Composite video was kind of the baseline for a lot of 80s computers and consoles, like this Apple IIe or the Nintendo NES. A lot of TVs in the 80s and onwards accepted composite video, and even today it's relatively easy to find display devices that accept it. Just look for the yellow RCA connector, that would be the composite video, and it usually has a white and red RCA jacks next to it for the stereo audio, which it's also very possible to just connect the yellow one just to get video if your computer doesn't have an audio out, for example. S-Video is another very popular video signal format, and early computers like the Atari 800 or the Commodore VIC-20 and Commodore 64 had it, even before it was called S-Video. S-Video is actually better quality than composite video, 
because it's, instead of having the whole signal mushed together into a single signal, it actually splits it out into two different ones, luminance and chrominance, which is just a fancy way of saying brightness and color. So that ends up resulting in a better overall image quality. You usually see S-Video connectors as those small, like four or seven uh, mini DIN connectors. They were much more popular in the US than in Europe. And interestingly enough, I don't think today as many display devices accept S-Video as they do composite. RGB is probably the best of the analog video signals, and it was present in quite a few computers from the 80s, like the Amstrad CPC or the Commodore Amiga series. In Europe, SCART connectors were very common, so a lot of European computers ended up outputting RGB and it was really easy to display. Unfortunately, RGB connectors were never much of a thing in the US, although there are some devices that accept RGB signals without using a SCART connector, like some of the Commodore monitors like this one. Component video out, not to be confused with composite video out, which I always get him confused, also offers really good image quality, but it wasn't very common in retro computer in the 80s. It actually was an optional output on the PlayStation 2 and the Dreamcast, which firmly dated in the mid 90s. Component video also splits the signal into three different signals to minimize interference. And so instead of having R, G, and B, you have luminance, and then you have something like red difference and blue difference, which is not as immediately obvious as R, G, B. Today, quite a few modern display devices accept component video, so that's actually a pretty good option. And interestingly, the European version of the ti 994 a which is a really early computer, also output a version of component out, but it's, in my experience, is not fully compatible with modern component video, so most devices don't accept it straight as it is. Since all those formats are analog, they can't be fed directly into a digital video input like HDMI. But if the display you're thinking of using has one of those inputs, then you can probably just make a cable easily and cheaply. One more thing. Sometimes video formats are almost compatible and they can be easily adjusted when you create a cable. For example, the standard RGB video format has a range for the voltages for each of the channels, but some computers, like some of the late Sinclair ZX Spectrums, would output voltages beyond that range. Usually that just means that colors show up too bright or overblown in some displays, but if that's the case, you can easily fix that by adding some resistors in series with the channel to lower the voltage intensity a bit. Before we start building the cable, I wanted to take a second to tell you about this video's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. If you've been watching the channel for a while, you probably know that I go back and forth between the US and Spain at different times of the year, and that is one of the reasons I have so many European computers here in the US. Unfortunately, a lot of websites get really confused by me accessing them from their different country where I created the account. Even I have a bank account that won't even let me access their site from a different country. That's one of the things that a service like Surfshark VPN solves beautifully. With a couple of clicks, I can easily change the region through which all my traffic is routed from, and suddenly, as far as the rest of the internet is concerned, I'm located in a different place in the world. Surfshark VPN works on mobile devices as well as computers, so you can use the same trick there, and it actually works on any amount of devices on your same VPN account. Of course, a VPN like Surfshark also greatly enhances your security on the internet by encrypting all the traffic from your computer so nobody can snoop and see what you're doing. And you may think, okay, I don't have a hacker tapping into my network trying to steal my secrets, and that's probably true, but your internet service provider is probably scanning and analyzing all that traffic and trying to create a profile about you from it. If you're using a VPN, you never have to worry about it. So if you're interested, you can sign up now with the code Noel's Retro Lab to get 83% off and three months free. You can find the sign up link in the description. So thank you Surfshark VPN, and now let's go back to the cable. When you're making a video cable, you often want to consider more than just the video signal. For example, you could use that opportunity to also carry the audio information from the computer to the display, assuming that's an option. Sometimes the audio signal is available in the same connector as the video signal in the computer, which is great, but sometimes the only way to get it is to connect to an audio jack, so plan accordingly when you're figuring out what you'll need for a particular cable. Another very common thing you'll need to provide sometimes is a certain fixed voltage at one of the terminals. I'm specifically thinking of the blanking signal on a SCART connector, but there could be other similar cases. This particular signal indicates to some displays that they need to process the video in RGB mode as opposed to composite mode. Without it, you'll usually get a very dark hint of a real image on the screen. This signal needs to be high somewhere between one and three volts, which sounds fine, 
except that a lot of the computers don't have a pin with constant high voltage at the video connector. And that's why sometimes you'll see an extra cable with a DC jack that expects to be fed 5 volts externally, or sometimes it's even some kind of external battery. Okay, with all of that out of the way, it's time to build the cable. But before that, we need to do some preparation. And this is a bit like cooking a fancy meal. The more preparation we do ahead of time, the easier the cooking will be. At this point, you should know what kind of signal your computer is generating and what kind of connectors you'll need. A lot of times, 80s computers used DIN connectors because they were quite handy to carry five to eight different signals. I usually keep an assortment of them on hand that covers a lot of computers. I recommend you don't try to build the cable from scratch, and by that I mean getting individual cables, connectors, and trying to assemble everything from scratch. Instead, just buy the closest cable you can to the one you need and change one of the ends to fit the computer. That's also a lot easier than getting two different cables and cutting them in the middle and then patching them in the middle. That's always go going to be a weak point of the cable, so it's much better to just replace one of the ends with a new connector. In my case, I want a DB9 connector on one end and a SCART connector on the other. Because SCART cables are rather rare here in the US, I'm going to start from a DB9 serial cable and attach the SCART connector to one of the ends. Another really, really important thing to do is make sure you get the male-female connectors correctly. Maybe it's just me, but I find it really easy to get confused, probably because I'm seeing what they're supposed to connect to and you're supposed to choose the opposite. So yeah, I've been known to build a cable just to find out that I used the wrong connector at the end. Don't do that. Physically test them even before you get it started. So in this case, this is the correct side I'm supposed to use. Get a video out pinout for the computer and a pinout for the cable connector. And if it's complicated at all, draw the connections from one to the other. That way you'll know exactly what you're doing when it comes time to solder instead of trying to figure it out on the fly. That might not be necessary for a simple component video, but if you're dealing with connectors with many pins like a SCART or even like a DIN 5 or 8, that can be a lifesaver. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that for this cable. This is the pinout for the RGB input on the Commodore monitor. Here's one of the problems when we start doing this. So this is the pinout and this is the connector that we're going to be using. This is a male DB9. It doesn't really say that here, but this is a female DB9. And so they're actually flipped horizontally from what you would expect. Fortunately, if you look really, really, really closely, there are some numbers there. This one that says five in here is really this one over here. What I've done is I've printed another one with the male version. And so the numbers are just you know, flipped horizontally, like I said. And now the thing to do is to trace the actual connections from the SCART connector to the DB9 male itself. We're going to be needing R, G, and B. We're going to be needing sync and ground. Yes, I got my daughter's markers to do this, <laughs> mismatched ones. And so we're going to be using this as the reference for the pinout for the, um, the monitor input. And then we have the SCART pinout right here. So let's start with red. So red is pin 15 here and is pin 3. Uh, so actually that one doesn't change. That one is the middle one anyway. So red will be like that. Green is four in here. So four is this one and it's here. So that will be four. And hey, it's nice that it's logical. Five is blue, which is this one. So blue will be like that. Then we need sync. For that, we'll use composite sync, which is seven here. Seven is this one. And that's like composite video blanking signal. So pin 19 to pin seven there. And then we just need a ground. There's uh, here, there's a bunch of common um, red ground, green ground, blue ground. Maybe we can tie them all together. But primarily, they need to go to just pin one or two. They're probably just the same thing. So uh, for now, I'll grab blue ground, so number five, and I connect it there. So there you go. Those are the connections that we need to make. So now we can finally go ahead and cut the cable. I'm going, so I need to remember, this is the side I'm using. Okay, so uh, I usually like to leave a little bit um, of uh, length on the other one, just in case I use this for any other project. And actually, this is plenty. I, I, I really don't want to make a long cable because this is going to be connecting to another cable. So actually, I'm going to cut it 
Yeah, right about there is fine. Right in the middle. There we go. And now let's strip the insulation in this end of the cable. So there you go. There we have all nine cables, probably plus ground. Yep. And now we need to strip the insulation in those as well. So we can solder them and test them and all of that. Okay, there you go. And now what we really should do is map which of those pins correspond to which of those cables. And we should write the result in here. So I'm gonna get the multimeter, put it in continuity mode. Okay, make sure that works. And now I'm going to be looking at the pins that we care about, and I'm gonna try to find the cable for them. Just to make my life easier, I'm going to use a D sub nine connector. So this is a female connector, and I think it will be easier yeah, they're sticking out, so it's gonna be easier to touch these pins than you know, going in there and stuff. So let's start with pin five, which is blue. Okay, perfect. And finally, we're ready to start soldering. I'm going to be using this Panavice holder. I think it's called Panavice Junior or something but it's extremely handy to be able to um, hold something as a, as a third hand, but this one is really solid and it doesn't tip over. So it's really useful for this kind of soldering. I'm going to be leaving a link in the description to all the tools that I'm using in the episode in case you're interested in checking some of them out. Now this next part is really, really important. So far we've been looking at the pinout of the SCART cable from the outside because it's what makes sense. That's what we're gonna connect it to things. But now, we're going to be soldering cables to it on the inside, which is going to, again, flip the pins themselves. Now, fortunately, again, in here we have numbers, so they are numbered uh, not on the outside so much, but they're numbered on the inside. If not, we could take this and we could flip it and maybe rewrite it or something, but I'm just gonna go with the numbers. And fortunately, this card cable has the shape, so that corner also helps to tell you where, well, actually, this is not particular with this one. It only helps when it's in the plastic cover itself. So yeah, we're just gonna go by the numbers, but that is very, very important. You need to remember to flip them, otherwise they're all gonna be wrong. For the soldering itself, I start by tinning each connector. That means I'm adding a small amount of solder now, and later I can just put the right cable and heat it up to solder it in place. When you tin them, and later when you solder the cable, it's also important not to heat up the pin too much. If you do, you will start melting the plastic around it and things will get out of alignment. Then I'll do the same thing with the cable ends. That prevents them from fraying and it will make actually soldering them in place really easy. Here's another one that will get you sooner or later. If the connector you're adding has some kind of plastic that doesn't open completely, like this opens, so that's fine, but this doesn't, make sure you put it in now. <laughs> if you solder this here, you will not be able to add it later. <laughs> Don't ask me how I know. So this needs to go in right now, and we just slide it down the cable for later. It's important that the cables don't short with each other, and some connectors are pretty cramped. If that's the case, you may want to put a small amount of heat shrink tubing around each one. If you do that, just like with the plastic protector, you need to slide it in now, otherwise it will be too late once you solder them. On the other hand, if the pins are pretty spaced out and there's no play or possibility that they'll touch, then there's no real need to add extra insulation. And now for the easy part, soldering each cable. Having a pair of tweezers can help with this since we're dealing with pretty thin cables and things need to be pretty accurate but just take your time and it will be fine. Since everything is tin, it's just a matter of putting the cable in the right place, touching it with a soldering iron until everything melts, and then removing the iron. Waiting a second and moving on to the next one. Now just repeat the number of cables you have and that's it. Before plugging it in, we can do some quick testing with the multimeter. Let's make sure the connections we identified are there and that things are not shorted together. Oh. The ground connection from 2 was supposed to be 10, 
but it's not doing it. Oh, okay, this is, this is why you check. I had it written tan, but it was this like off color orange. So yeah, they're, they're pretty similar. So I incorrectly uh, put that one there. I just need to change sync. Yep, okay, I need to resolder that one. Okay, I just fixed that and I just wanna make sure that is working correctly. So that's ground pin two. Yep. Okay, so this should be good to go. Let's actually test it on the monitor. I'm going to use this Amstrad 6128 Plus to test it because it only has an RGB out and the only cable I have is RGB to SCART. So I haven't been able to use it for many months. So this should be a great test. Oh, I see we're clearly getting a picture with the blue background and the yellow letters, but the image is rolling. So that tells me right away that the sync is off somehow. Let's go back and check the schematics and see what I've messed up. I think I found the problem. Here, have a look at this. See here, I connected pin seven of the monitor connector to pin 19 of the SCAR connector because this is labeled as the sync signal out. And that makes sense, that is correct from the point of view of the computer generating the sync signal. However, this pinout is probably taken from the point of view of a display device with that connector in. So from the display device point of view, sync out is the sync signal it generates out, not the one that it receives. So the one that it receives from the computer should be in sync signal in. So really I need to change the cable going from pin seven to pin 19 to go from pin seven to pin 20. And that should probably fix our problem. SCAR connectors are probably the most complicated kind of video connectors that I've had to deal with. So I guess they're a good example for this. Okay, so I'm going to rewire that pin and try again. Okay, with the sync signal change, let's try it again. Oh, perfect, beautiful. Image looks absolutely perfect. So yeah, I think the cable is working perfectly now and you get a good taste of what happens when you mess a little connection up. Once all the cables are soldered, we just need to reassemble the connector. One important thing is to add some kind of strain relief. That means that you don't want any force that you apply to the cable to carry over to the solder joints you just created. A lot of connectors will have their own strain relief, but if they don't, you need to add something to hold the cable in place. Or like in this case, the connector snaps to the cable, but this particular cable isn't thick enough. So I'm just gonna add some electrical tape to make it thicker. I know this is not the best material for it, but it will work for now. Here are some things you can look out for if things don't work out. First of all, is your computer actually working? It's really nice to have a computer that you know it's working for sure before making a cable. Otherwise, if things don't work correctly, you have no idea where the problem is coming from. If you're getting no image on the screen, one important distinction is whether you're getting a black screen or no signal whatsoever. A black screen is a correctly formed video signal with sync, color information, and all of that, but containing a black image. The other one is a signal that doesn't match a normal video signal. Most panel displays will actually tell you if you're getting a signal or not, so that can be really useful in debugging. If you're getting an image, but the colors are off, you probably either swapped some color channels accidentally, or one of the channels just doesn't have the correct connection and it's missing. And if there's something there, but the image is unstable and rolling, then it probably means that the sync signal isn't being received correctly. Maybe it was soldered to an incorrect place, or maybe you use the incorrect sync signal since sometimes there's a separate signal by itself and sometimes it's combined with a luminance. So just double check the specs and try it again. As you can see, this is a reasonably involved process with many points of failure. Someone who makes many of the same cables can really benefit from figuring out the layout, getting all the necessary components and just getting the procedure down and churn out a cable every five minutes. That's what most of the time you're just better off buying one already made but it's also good to know what's involved just in case you're stuck with it and you need to make one yourself. Just a quick reminder to check out the Surfshark VPN with the link in the description. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you next time.